Good afternoon. My name is Hunter Land. I am Vice President of Research and Development for BRC. For those of you who don't know BRC, we're a Schedule I research facility and manufacturing producer of cannabinoids. Uh, I've been in research about 20 years. 12 has been focused on cannabinoids, and so I picked up a couple disclosures along the way. So uh, today I've come to talk to you a little bit about cannabinoids, aging, and potential effects on neurological uh, diseases. Start, the start of this, um, it began with conversations with the FDA around um, the CBD laws and how to effectively determine a safe dose of CBD. The FDA was very interested in, you know, acutely we're not seeing anything uh, toxic, but what happens when you take this for long periods of time, potentially you know, decades? And there's a, it's very difficult to do that type of work in mammalian models. Rodents take years and it's quite costly. So one of the models that is used for that is the C. elegans model. Uh, we looked at CBD in this model, which I'll tell you about those results. Uh, cannabigerol in that model as well. Um, and then that brought us to, well, if we're seeing this in healthy wild type, what happens in diseased models, uh, which brought us to the tau model. So why C. elegans? Um, they do have the best characterized genetics of any animal that we know. Um, a lot of the metabolic signaling pathways are conserved with humans. Uh, they have short lifespans, three to four weeks, so this is high throughput, you can look at a bunch of different compounds uh, very quickly uh, and cost effectively. It's easy to track life movement. We can do this with AI and machine learning. And as far as toxicity and safety goes, it's as predictable as many mammalian models. It's kind of like the canary in the coal mine approach, um, just with nematodes. Uh, this model's accepted, the EPA likes this model. If we don't know exactly what's in, let's say, contaminated water, we don't know what to test for, we can determine if it's toxic just by utilizing the C. elegans model. If they die quicker, probably don't want to spend much time in the water. You certainly don't want to drink it. Same kind of application here. Um, and it's also been used by NASA and the International Space Station to kind of determine what are the effects at atmosphere uh, for long periods of time. So the first study we looked at CBD. Um, what you don't see on this slide is the, um, the initial study where we tried to determine uh, what the therapeutic range was, and that's done through thermotolerance. And what we saw was the three doses, or the dose ranges were 10, 40, and 100 micromolar, where we weren't seeing toxicity, um, and actually potential some, uh, some potential reduction in stress. Uh, so those are the, the, the doses that we use for this, this particular lifespan model. Um, and we did ultimately see increased lifespan um, in, in all three doses, with the 40 micromolar being the best, um, and an extension of approximately 18% in lifespan. So positive, they didn't live forever, but it's roughly consistent with what you would see with things like resveratrol or metformin, again, not compared in this specific study, but looks positive and non-toxic. We also looked at uh, movement, which is, a, which is an indicator of health and good health. And we, again, saw improvement in health span characteristics, this activity. And um, it, it was primarily in the 40 micromolar range. And you can see, if you look at day 12 to day 15, the green being the 40 micromolar, you see that's almost consistent with, with what you see in the normal healthy nematodes without CBD at day 12. So um, again, this is a C. elegans model, but it would be great if, you know, 80-year-old humans acted more like 60-year-old hum humans. So exciting, but again, take it, you know, in the confines of this model. Uh, definitely positive and potentially good in the wellness sector. So you moved on to cannabigerol, which has been an interest of mine as well as many others. 
uh, here for some time. Um, and we actually found in the thermal tolerance test that it was much more well tolerated than CBD. So if you notice the dose range we have here, 7.5, 75, and 375 micromolar, uh, higher than what we tested at CBD, and that's because the initial um, toxicity wasn't seen with cannabigerol. And again, we see the, the, the middle dose, the 75 micromolar, extending mean lifespan by about 19%. So again, looks positive, doesn't look toxic, uh, good news. Uh, we, of course, shared this with FDA. I'm not sure they cared much, but uh, we did share it. We also looked at health span, a, a bit more variable in this particular model, but again, the middle dose at day 15, we see increased locomotor activity. So again, another positive, uh, cannabigerol seems to extend lifespan, at least the nematodes, and health span characteristics. So that brought us to, well, that's great for the wellness category and for people that may want to, you know, utilize this as a supplement, but what about in diseases? You know, what, what disease model in C. elegans has been accepted? Uh, and we landed on the tau model of C. elegans. Um, so, so many, for those of you that aren't familiar with tau, I imagine most of you are, um, but it is characterized by these intercellular aggregates of this tau protein. And what that does is it disrupts signaling. It also affects mitochondrial motility. There's uh, uh, many ramifications. And we see this not just in Alzheimer's dementia, but also traumatic brain injury, epilepsy, stroke, even cancer, and some other um, specific diseases. Um, even in instance of concussion, the, the movement between the gray matter and the white matter can stretch the neurons, resulting in increased tau uh, expression. So um, it is a problem. We don't know how much it causes the disease or it's a symptom, but it's definitely in this model, these um, nematodes don't live nearly as long as their counterparts. Okay. So we use this tau strain, it's BR5270, um, and they have drastic reductions in survival compared to wild type. Um, the design was we had a vehicle control, so just the BR5270, the tau C. elegans. And then we had positive control of the 40 micromolar CBD. So keep in mind, there's not really a great positive control for tau. If we had that, we would probably treat a lot more diseases. But we didn't know that it was effective in wild type at life extension and health, plan, health span improvements. So we stuck with this kind of optimal dose that we found in the previous study. Um, as the exploratory test articles, we looked at, we, we've been in partnership with uh, Conerta, so thank you Conerta, uh, for providing the canflavins because those are difficult to produce and we don't have them and uh, also from informing on study design as far as dosing and concentrations are concerned as it relates to canflavins. Uh, so the goal here was to look at, initially, to look at can canflavins specifically at, uh, compared to CBD. So those were matched 40, 20, and 5. So 40 being the exact dose of CBD, and then 20 and 5 um, as, as reduced doses or exposures of canflavins. Then we looked at a botanical drug substance, um, which contained at those concentrations, so 80 micromolar, that is CBD. So that does not include the CBG component and the THC component and the other minor cannabinoids that are in this botanical drug substance. So we can essentially do a direct comparison at the 40 micromolar group of CBD isolate versus CBD BDS plus the other constituents. And then at 20 would be roughly half the CBD exposed uh, as the control group. And then lastly, we combined them all. So we said, what happens when you combine CBD, CBG, Delta 9 THC, the minors, and canflavins versus the isolate? So really trying to figure out, is there some rational polypharmacy? Is there this entourage effect? Or is it more of a non-entourage effect, which you can see in some models and with some compounds. Uh, and this was completed in triplicate. 
So first, uh, we looked at the cam flavins, and uh, you can see the separation. So if you look at the, the, the brown and the orange, uh, that's clearly separating from the control, the, the green, and then once more um, from the purple. So you see this nice trend. Again, they're not living forever, but um, they don't live very long. So. When you move into the t-test, uh, you can see the control CBD at day 16. Uh, that's at lower um, blue bar. You see that's about 4% survival. So pretty, pretty poor outcome uh, if you're a BR2, BR5270 C. elegans and you don't get anything. CBD, uh, about double. Uh, nice trend, but not as good as what we see camflavins alone. So again, we've got 40 micromolar camflavin looking superior to CBD alone, and 20 micromolar camflavin, again, superior to CBD alone. We moved on to look at uh, the same group, but with the botanical drug substance. So this is CBD, CBG, and Delta-9 THC versus CBD versus control. You see this nice trend and kind of this early bump in survival at day eight. So looking very positive. And as you move into survival, and again, back to the t-test, uh, you see 22% survival and 19% at 80 and 40 micromolar. So again, about double, um, a little bit more than double on the 80 micromolar, but uh, almost double at a match CBD dose. And still, once again, even better at the 20 micromolar. So again, positive, um, positive both at day 12 and day 16. So finally, we looked at the canflavin plus the botanical drug substance. We again see elevation early on, day eight, a little bit better than what we saw with CBD, BDS on its own, and certainly better than CBD. And that trend continues throughout the study. As we move into this, overall, not seeing at day 16, not seeing significantly better uh, survival than we saw with just uh, the botanical drug substance. Although we do see some improvements kind of midlife. So if you look at that day 12, 56% versus 39, pretty much across all dose groups, um, very positive. And again, even the 20 micromolar dose at 14% survival is better than 10 and certainly better than four. So about three to four fold higher survival levels. The last thing that we looked at was activity levels. It was um, quite difficult to examine activity levels because these uh, nematodes were so uh, entangled with tau, so to speak. Uh, so we didn't really see very much. The only thing that we, we saw in terms of positive was at day eight with the camflavin. So we saw a little bit increase, the statistical increase in um, motility at day eight. We didn't see it with CBD. We didn't see it with any of the botanical drug substance. Um, but on a positive note, we didn't see the sedation or we didn't see lack of activity, which you know the cliche would be that maybe stoned C. elegans don't move around as much. Um, but we didn't see that. So we didn't see toxicity. We didn't see decreased activity um, and only a slight increase with camflavin at uh, day eight. And um, unfortunately, uh, there's kind of a rule of thumb that I've, I've come up with working in, with cannabinoids. Even if you're Schedule I DEA facility and you're working with a partner that has a Schedule I license, and it should be really easy to send 25 grams of THC to them, it still takes three months for the DEA to add a protocol and for you to be able to ship the, the, the product there. So what I've shared today is preliminary data. Um, we are looking to see specifically um, if there have been changes in the, the, the amount of tau in the, the C. elegans. And um, we have plans to, to do further research with this data set, just that information is not available yet. So thank you. Sutter, that was really interesting. I'm sure one of the questions that come up, these concentrations seem high. Can you provide a little translation for us uh, about whether these are achievable levels, uh, say in a mammal, uh, or what the comparative dosing might be? 
So a great question, Ethan. So these are, the concentrations are actually their living, living environment. So they're consuming uh, essentially the bacterium, the E. coli um, that is exposed to this. So they're consuming CBD. So the actual intracellular levels are not this high. It's much more consistent with what we would get. So about the 80 micromolar would be consistent with exposure in the epidiolex trial um, at 20 mg per kick. So as you go down, uh, you have about half that at 40, and again, further reduced at 20. Um, it's not exact, but that is the best way that we've been able to kind of come up with the, the correct physiologically relevant concentration. So again, not quite like um, oncology studies where you're looking at these super high exposures. It, is, it does tend to mimic more uh, whole organism, real life kind of situation. Very good. Thank you. Okay. All right. Thank you very much.